You know, it's usually in a time like this when you, uh, you'd get up and you'd make a remark on behalf of the family to the, to the many that would gather and come through and pay tribute and respect to a life well lived, but in this case, I think everybody's family. I don't know of too many, if any, that did not know Aunt Jerry is just that, Aunt Jerry. Uh, she had a way of touching lives. She had a way of making you feel like the most important person in the moment. I do get the honor and the privilege of being the family member that gets to get up and say a few words. And in a few moments after that, Brother Everson will get up and share more in depth from God's holy word about what we experience today and what Aunt Jerry is experiencing now. It will humble you to stand up and try to eulogize, if you will, a life like Aunt Jerry lived. Uh, I was asking some of the family earlier, I said, well, who is going to upsell the rest of y'all at Crawford Jewelers now? And I don't <laughs> think they got that person. A permanent fixture in many of our minds of Crawford Jewelers, a lady well into her 90s driving to work, showing a commitment of dedication, showing a commitment of what it was to serve and to give and to put a smile on your face and show value into who you were as a person. Uh, I can say from my own life and growing up in this blessed family that I can't think of a time I ever spoke to Aunt Jerry and many others can subscribe to this that there was judgment in a conversation. That there was any serious picking might have been some picking and you always felt real special when you got a slice of cake unless it was of course a fake cake <laughs> just recently she enjoyed pulling the joke on Trey Thompson uh, preparing him a nice birthday cake if you've not heard the story and I would guess that if you're in this room you've probably heard this story and as he tried to slice the cake you can almost hear the snicker it wasn't real but I get to share a story of what I will take down as a memory that I will hold until my last day comes and that is to hear her talk of her Lord to hear her smile about church and for me to get to take my children over to the to the comfort home just across town and to watch she and her sister compare their manicures <laughs> you see I get the blessing of calling her sister my granny and as my granny went up to the bedside of Aunt Jerry and they I told my girls I, and my son, I said, y'all look right there. They're, they're over there comparing color shades and who had the best nail, nails of the day. You see, that's what I believe Aunt Jerry would want us to have is that hope and that, that joyful remembrance of what she put into our lives. In the Bible, the book of 1 Peter in chapter 3 and verse 15 says but that we are to sanctify the Lord God in our hearts, that we're to be prepared at all times to give every man an answer of the hope that is in us. And we're to give that answer with reverence and fear. That is meekness and fear. And I believe if nothing else in this life, I've been given some great examples, and Aunt Jerry is at the top of them, of how to live a life of hope. No matter what the clouds may say, no matter what the calendar may say, no matter what the doctor may say, there's hope. And for that, I'll ever be grateful. I'll ever be grateful to have shared a part of her life with my children. But the beauty of it is that sharing doesn't end today. That, that, that sharing doesn't end when a time is recorded in a book on this side of eternity. You see, as long as we have life, we get to share that hope. And we get to share that promise with those that we love and those that we are blessed to have in our lives. So if I could challenge you with this, Look to a model that we're here celebrating today. A life that we can't really be sad about because 
I don't know many who will get the opportunity to live a life like Aunt Jerry did and to step from this side of eternity into heaven's glory. So if I could encourage you with one thing today, that is to have hope. And as 1 Peter 3.15 says, be prepared at all times to give an answer to anyone who asks you of the reason of that hope. And do it with respect. Show love and be loved. Let me pray for us. Father, I do love you today, God. God, I thank you for your grace and your mercy. God, that that we deserve that you keep from us, that that we don't deserve that you give us so freely. God, we thank you for the life of Aunt Jerry today. We thank you for that example of grace and mercy through her. God, we thank you for your promise of an eternal rest and home with no sickness and no more death. God, I thank you for the lives that she touched. I thank you for the opportunities I've had in my life to have conversations with her. God, to just to be blessed by her. Father, for comfort, I ask for everyone in this room. There will no doubt in the days to come and months that the void will become more real than it is now. And Lord, I do know this, that when there's a God-shaped hole, there's only one thing that'll fill it, and that's you. So Father, that is my prayer and my blessing that not only a hedge of protection be put around every individual in the home they represent, but that God, when they feel empty and undone and without, that they can turn to you. Because I believe in my heart that's what Aunt Jerry would have them to do. So, Father, I pray today that you just give us that hope. Let us live that hope. And, God, let us share that hope. We ask all these things in your holy and precious name. Amen.
Pastor Jacob. Thank you all for being here today. You know, God blessed Miss Jerry's life in so many different ways. He blessed her with such a, a long, fruitful life. I was just looking at the obituary this week, thinking born in 1927, uh, born before the Great Depression, lived through the terms of 17 different U.S. presidents. And it wasn't just a long life. It was such a rich life, surrounded by people who she loved. That was one of the things that stood out as I visited her at the Satilla Hospice House or um, um, at the Baptist Village was every time I went, family was there, but it was different family just about every time I went. She was surrounded by people who she loved. Um, there was the line in her obituary, uh, I won't get it exactly right, but it said something like she didn't have children of her own, but she had uh, countless nieces and nephews who adored her and who she loved to dote on or something like that. It was a great description of, of the relationship you guys had with her, how she loved y'all and the love that y'all showed so evidently for her over the last few weeks, especially as uh, she was going through those times. So we're thankful for her life and thankful for how she carried herself. One of the things I appreciated about Miss Jerry was how she always carried herself with such grace. Um, there was just a class that exuded from her, uh, not that she ever gave the impression that she was better than anybody, but just a dignity that exuded from her. She was pleasant to be around. I think Chad mentioned she had a way when you were around her of always making you feel like you were important, that you were significant, and had uh, such a sharp mind and a uh, good sense of humor all the way to the end. That was one of God's great gifts to her, even in those last weeks, was how sharp her mind continued to be and the conversations she was able to continue having. And, and uh, the generous spirit that God gave her. Um, she was a giver. I heard several stories of socks and uh, towels tucked with $100 bills, um, all kinds of gifts she gave. And not just gifts, but she, she loved to give her time. She obviously loved to bake, and that deserves almost a service of its own because uh, man could she bake. I've heard a number, number of people at church this morning who said something about their favorite dessert being something that Miss Jerry made, and I think the most uh, one I heard most often was her blueberry cake. That's what we had all the time at church. If we had a social event going on at our church or a funeral, she would serve when somebody in our church died. She would serve, and she would bring a blueberry cake, and it would be the talk of the meal. If you didn't right away go to the dessert table when the service was over, you were not going to get a slice of her cake. And she was very particular about how it was going to be cut, and a cake like that deserved to be cut in a special way. But she was particular about how she wanted her cake to be cut, um, she'll be missed for a lot of reasons. Uh, there was a time when our, our church, we would do a cake auction every year to raise funds for our youth camp. And uh, her cake every year was the top uh, money winner. People would pay a lot of money to get to go home with Miss Jerry's cake. Uh, she was a member of our church family for 25 years and a follower of Jesus for much longer than that. She um, was a Bacon County native and uh, was telling me the other day that when she was a young girl in Bacon County, she became aware that she was a sinner, and she put her trust in Jesus to save her. And that's why we may be sad on a day like this, but we are not in despair on a day like this. Um, because we know that her trust in this life was in Jesus, which means she went to be with Jesus at the moment of her death. Um, the last passage of scripture I had a chance to read with her was um, Wednesday morning, I think it was. And I read to her from the book of Revelation. And I thought I'd read a few of the verses from, from that with you. This afternoon, uh, Revelation chapter 21 is what I'm going to read from. Starting in verse 1, I'll just read a couple verses at a time. John writes, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. And then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. John is describing the day after the final judgment when God creates a new earth. This current earth that's so affected and twisted by sin is going to be done away with. God's going to create a new earth. And, and John describes seeing the heavenly city descend and rest on this brand new earth. And it's this heavenly city that believers go to now when we die. This is the place Jesus descri is describing in John 14. You remember where he says, In my Father's house are many mansions and I go there to prepare a place for you. Well, this is that place that Jesus is preparing for us. John is seeing it. And John said it looks like, he can't even put it into words, so he just uses metaphors. He says it looks like a bride adorned for her husband. Think of how a bride looks on her wedding day. Just glowing, stunning, 
Everything's perfect. That's how John is describing heaven. Just the perfect place. Everything is as it should be. And then John says this in verse 3. He says, And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. Think about what John's doing. He's describing this heavenly city, which is our home as believers. And of all the things he could describe, the first thing he mentions isn't the streets. The first thing he mentions isn't the gates or the walls. The first thing he mentions is that in that city, God will be with his people in a special way. I mean, that's, that's the fulfillment of our salvation as Christians, isn't it? You think of uh, Chad read from 1 Peter 3 a minute ago. There's another verse in 1 Peter 3 that says, Jesus died once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. That's, that's the goal. That's the destination point of our salvation is the promise that one day we'll be with God. And heaven is the ultimate fulfillment of that. That's why I mentioned a second ago, there's, there's sorrow on a day like this, but not despair. When we think about what Miss Jerry is experiencing now, our hearts should soar, not just because of a reunion with loved ones who died in the Lord, but because of the promise that those who die with their faith in the Lord go to be with the Lord. She's experiencing the fullness of God's presence in a way that we can only dream of. Well, John then describes what the heavenly city is like. And it's almost like he can't put it into words. He can't tell us what heaven is like, so the best he can do is tell us what heaven's not like. So rather than telling us what's there, he spends most of his time telling us what's not there. There are so many things that define our lives here that won't even be present there. So here's the way John says it. This is Revelation 21, verse 4. John says, And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have been passed away. Do you see all the things that define our lives now that John is saying they're not going to have any place in that in that heavenly home. So John says there will be no more tears. God's going to wipe away every tear. That means there will be no more pain, no more sorrow, no more death. There won't be a single second of loneliness or depression or despair. No more crying again ever. And then John says, and there will be no more death. It's hard to even imagine that because our lives here, death is the, the sword that hangs over us from the time that we're born. The way Hebrew says it is that all of humanity is enslaved to the fear of death. But because Jesus not only died but rose from the dead, it's like he broke the jaws of death so that death won't keep its hold on us, so there won't even be any death in that world, which means, man, this is good news, which means we'll never there sit through a service like this again, that there will never be a single goodbye there. And then God says this in verse 5, then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write these words, for they are true and faithful. That's a good way to think about life in heaven. God says, I make all things new. It is a brand new kind of life there. A brand new kind of life that we'll experience forever. This world is broken. That one's perfectly whole. This world is filled with pain. That world will be completely free of any of that. And so the question that it leaves us with at the end of verse 5 is, so who is heaven for? Who goes there? Well, listen to what he says as I wrap up. This is going down into verse 6 and verse 7. God says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God and he shall be my son. There are two phrases that John uses to, describes, to describe who goes to heaven. He describes it as he who thirsts and he who overcomes. What does it mean to thirst? Well, think about what thirst is. You, thirst is when you feel your need for something to drink, right? Well, John is saying that this is who heaven is for. Heaven is for those who sense their spiritual thirst, who are, who are aware of the fact that, that our souls have been parched by sin, we're aware of the fact that we hunger and thirst for a righteousness that we don't have. So we look to Jesus to meet that need. We look to Jesus to satisfy that thirst. That's the first 
first way John describes who goes to heaven. Then the second way he describes it is it's for those who overcome, meaning heaven is for those who have an overcoming faith in the Lord. It's, it's for those who have a trust in Jesus that endures all the trials and tribulations of this life because we recognize Jesus is the only one who can free us from hell. Jesus is the only one who can forgive our sins. Jesus is the only one who can give us eternal life. So, so we have a faith anchored in Jesus that's there, come what may. That's what an overcoming faith is. And John says, for those who have that faith in Jesus, this is the promise that we have. We have the promise that we'll be with the Lord forever. I, I just said a few minutes ago, there's a great verse that I, I use lots of times at funerals where Paul is talking to the church at Thessalonica about how we view death as Christians. And he says that we grieve, but we don't grieve as those who have no hope. We have hope because we worship a Savior who overcame the grave for us. We have a Savior who conquered death. So we know that for Miss Jerry, who professed faith in Jesus and lived out of faith in Jesus, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Let's bow together for a word of prayer. Father, we think of, of Paul's words in Philippians where he says, To live is Christ and to die is gain. And so, Father, as we stand over caskets, as we sit in funeral services like this as Christians, it draws to our memory the fact, Lord, that we're here to know Christ and make much of Christ, but death for those who trust in you is not loss. Death for those who trust in you is great gain. So, Father, we thank you for the hope that you've given us that endures days like this. We thank you for the life of Aunt Jerry. We thank you for the scores of people who her life impacted, who saw your love and grace emanate from her. And we thank you, Lord, for the grace that you showed in saving her and the hope that you've given her in Jesus. And we thank you for all these things in Jesus' great name. Amen. There is no gravesite, so I'm going to end our time together by reading a psalm with you, and then we're going to close with a word of prayer. So I'm going to read Psalm 23, where David writes, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Father, again, thank you for the promise that you are a faithful shepherd, that you are with us 
in the good and easy times, you're with us when we are um, in green pastures and by still waters. And Lord, you also promise that you walk with us through the valley of the shadow of death. And Lord, I pray that you would, in a special way, minister to this family as they go through this time, that they be reminded of your presence, that they be reminded of a Savior who gives us a hope that extends beyond the grave. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.